The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, dragons making out on compound interest, gnome popcorn, and bare nakedness behind the plasma curtain. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. This time we have Larry Correa, Sarah A. Hoyt, and Bain publisher Tony Weiskopf talking about the new Monster Hunter series book, Monster Hunter Guardian by Larry Correa and Sarah A. Hoyt. We get into the Monster Hunter universe, the heroes and villains of the book, and we find out everything you want to know about Mr. Trashbags. Good stuff, and that's coming up. Plus more Larry Correa as we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. Now here's the news. We have a really excellent nonfiction piece up at the Bane.com main page this month. You should check it out. This is The Universe Beyond the Plasma Frequency by Carrie Hensley. Now, Carrie is a Ph.D. candidate in astronomy at Boston University and a writer for the award-winning research news website AAS Nova, as well as Astrobytes, so she knows where if she speaks. Though we've been gazing up at the sky since the dawn of mankind, only recently, relatively speaking, have our tools for doing so become sophisticated enough to help us learn about our universe in greater detail. But our atmosphere blocks a huge amount of radiation, both for good and ill, which prevents us from more understanding of the cosmos. In this month's nonfiction essay, Carrie explains why this is and how we may be on the brink of solving this problem in gazing out into the universe like never before. The Universe Beyond the Plasma Frequency by Carrie Hensley is available free at the Bain.com main page and will be available perpetually as part of the free ebook download at Bain eBooks. That one is called Free Nonfiction 2019. You can download it there. So check out this excellent piece. I want to welcome Larry Correa and Sarah A. Hoyt to the podcast again. Hey, folks. Oh, also, we have Tony Weiskopf, Bain publisher, with us. Hey, everybody. So, Larry Correa is the creator of the Wall Street Journal and New York Times best selling Monster Hunter series with first entry Monster Hunter International, as well as urban fantasy hard boiled adventure saga, The Grim Noir Chronicles. That one is Hard Magic, is the first one in that, and epic fantasy series, The Saga of the Forgotten Warrior, Son of the Black Sword, and uh, this year's, um, oh, what's the name of it? House of Assassins. There we go. House <laughs> of Assassins. He is an avid gun user and advocate and shoots on a competitive level and shot at a competitive level for many years. Before becoming a full-time writer, he was a military contract accountant, a small business accountant, and manager of a gun shop, among other things. Larry lives in Utah with his wife and family. Sarah A. Hoyt is the author of over 30 books in science fiction, fantasy, mystery, romance, and historical fiction. Her first published novel, Ill Met by Moonlight, was a finalist for the Mythopoetic Award. Dark Ship Thieves, the first novel that's a Bane book of her popular Dark Ship Thieves series, is a Prometheus Award winner. Uncharted, her collaboration with Kevin G. Anderson, is the winner of the Dragon Award for Best Fantasy Novel um, a couple of years ago. Larry, by the way, is also a three-time Dragon Award winner, I think. Sarah was born and raised in Portugal and now lives in Colorado near her two grown sons with her husband and burying clouder of cats. Um, in fact, I think, Larry, you're Portuguese-American on one side, aren't you? I am, yeah. My uh, grandpa came over from the Azores. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm second generation born here. Cool. So we have a, a Portuguese team, as it were. Um, out now at Booksellers Everywhere is Monster Hunter Guardian, a new entry in the mainline Monster Hunter International series by Larry Correa and Sarah A. Hoyt. I guess we should, we should set up the universe um, and where we are in the timeline. The first thing we notice in Monster Hunter Guardian is that Julie Shackelford Pitt 
Uh, she's a new mother with six-month-year-old uh, baby Ray, big healthy big boy, and her husband has not met his, this son yet. So where's Owen, who is who is basically one of our main characters in the uh, in the Monster Hunter series so far? Uh, well, so the last book in the Monster Hunter series was Monster Hunter Siege. That was book six, and um, Guardian overlaps it in the timeline, but Siege. <laughs> Uh, is about this great big mission. It's actually a rescue mission where a whole bunch of the world's monster hunters team up and they go to this island uh, above the Arctic Circle uh, on this big, crazy mission that actually uh, Owen winds up going into another dimension, actually. And so what's happened is uh, he's been gone for a long time and he's actually he's kind of missing in action when this takes place. And so Julie... Uh, because she was pregnant when the mission started, she wound up being the person that uh, wound up uh, getting volunteered to stay home and run the company. And but it's, so she's been running a kind of shoestring operation because most of her good people are off uh, busy on the siege, and so she's been kind of holding down the fort. And so siege overlaps the latter half of Guardian, and if you read siege. Uh, it kind of ends on a bit of a cliffhanger where the big bad guy uh, is confronting Owen and says, you know, I basically just, that I just kidnapped your son. You know, I'm going to make you pay. And uh, so I didn't really resolve that. And people are like, well, what happened? What happened? Like, well, that's the entire novel of Guardian, <laughs> uh, which uh, we've been planning for a long time. And so we, then we, for Guardian, we flip back to Julie and what's going on back at home. So you say that Julie is holding down the fort. Uh, what does that mean? What is this company? Um, sort of uh, for the for the listeners that that don't know the world, kind of give us a, a brief uh, encapsulation of, of of the series. Uh, Monster Hunter International is a private company that specializes in handling monster profit or monster problems for profit. Um, so they're professional monster killers. Uh, they're an uh, uh, international organization, but there's a bunch of rival companies, too. It's just, you know, good old-fashioned capitalism competition. And uh, these guys are located in uh, Casador, Alabama, that is where their offices are. They have got offices all over the U.S. And um, Julie is uh, Shackelford, and so she's descended from the founder of the company. And so she's basically the heir uh, to run the – it's a family business. And so she's basically the heir that runs the business. They have hundreds of employees, but but she's she's kind of the uh, the the boss or one of the bosses that runs the place. And so being the one uh, was pregnant, it made sense for them to leave her home, which she really hates. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she really hates it. Is this the first time that we see a, a female point of view in the Monster Hunter universe? Um. There have been other brief ones. Uh, there were there were other uh, brief ones early on. I was going to say there were interludes. I think, just as a fan, there were times when you dip into female point of views. Points of view. Yeah, this, this was the first one. It was a full novel, and uh, Sarah had a what I thought was a really good voice for Julie. And which is why we teamed up on this one, and and Sarah killed it. She was it was awesome. So this is the first full full length novel um, from a female narrator. Yeah, and she this is first person told the whole way through, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a very uh, it's a very gripping situation she's in because she has the baby doesn't have any clue whether her husband and most of the company is alive or dead. And these are also all her friends. And, you know, so it's kind of like her entire extended family is missing in action. So it's a very compelling point of view. Having been a new mother, I can, I could put myself there and go, ah, I'd be going nuts anyway. So tell us specifically about Julie's character. Um, what she's like and, and where she's coming from. So Julie is, um, so she grew up in a monster hunter family. So she's always been a little weird by, by normal people's standards because she grew up in this kind of hyper militant environment where the whole family business is about, you know, professional monster killing. Um, I mean, she skipped, she, she missed her senior prom because of a monster incident. 
And, you know, she'd been working at the family business since she was a teenager. Uh, and, and her, in fact, it, and she had encounters with monsters when she was a little kid even because of her family business, one of which is a, is a character that pops up in the book, uh, her <laughs> childhood uh, imaginary best friend, who turned out wasn't, wasn't very imaginary at all. But um, so she's always had a different perspective. And when we first meet Julie, we, we kind of open with a, something from her past, an incident which was referred to in the books earlier, where um, she had gotten out of monster hunting for a little while. Um, and she went during her college years. And she went off to, and she decided she was going to be a normal person. And she's actually super intelligent. And so she was kind of on an academic path. And she wound up in a, in a, in a monster related incident anyway. Or it's just her nature. Um, she has a very protective nature. Uh, when she takes ownership of something, she sees it through. And she's hyper competent and really, really tough. I mean, she knows her limitations. She knows her weaknesses. She recognizes those and she works around them. Uh, so basically, Julie's just a, she's just a professional. She's a consummate professor. And uh, I mean, now, now at the current timeline, she's running the business. She's She's really she's the company negotiator because she's got her crap together basically, and, and most of the people in the company really suck with with other human beings. So mm-hmm. she's by far the best at like schmoozing. Um, and so we have this person now. She's a new mom, so she's stressed out, exhausted, and uh, worried about her family and friends who are all missing. And also because she's hyper competent, she's feeling really awful because she can't use those skills. I mean, she's just there basically talking to people on the phone and doing paperwork. And it's killing her because, you know, she's really good at what she does, but she can't actively do anything because she's stuck with the kid. Um, and so that's, that's when we first get her. She's, we have a little analogy there to a lion at the zoo in a cage. <laughs> <laughs> Bored and pissed. <laughs> now, Julie's a great character. I've, I've, I've wanted to do this book for, for a long time. Well, for me, the previous book, Siege, was the daddy book where where Owen is learning about what it takes to be a dad, and and this is a this is the companion mommy book, and uh, Julie's learning learning her limitations and what it takes to be a mom, um, and uh, c- coming up against things that she thought she was prepared for, but um, but but maybe wasn't. Um, one of which is. Uh, uh, again, something that all mothers uh, or most mothers have had to deal with, which is interference from the grandmothers. <laughs> so uh, that 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 becomes an important <laughs> important way of looking at Julie's past and her future is is uh, and, and the way that you guys integrate that into the book was was interesting to me as a mother. Um, uh, I didn't have to deal with certain uh, problems that Julia's had with her mother. But <laughs> yeah. um, There's but, some serious interference from Julie's undead vampire mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, there's the, there's in, the, the intergenerational interaction is uh, is, is fun in this one. Uh-huh. So. Uh, this this um, child in danger. Um, yeah, maybe let's set up uh, what happens. There's a possible monster killing in a nearby Alabama town. Julie, um, Julie and her uh, her accountant, I think, basically uh, is uh, Albert, right? Everybody, the researcher. Yeah, the researcher. Yeah, the researcher. The researcher. He's the researcher. Yeah. Um, they go to talk to this guy who who handled some monsters and in Larry's world, um, if you can kill some monsters, uh, you're a possible recruit after you get over the fact that monsters exist, right? Larry, there's, everybody doesn't know the monsters exist is, is the idea. They're not allowed to, uh, they're not allowed to advertise because of government mandated secrecy. So basically monsters are secret officially for, for, for reasons. There's various reasons for this in the universe. Whether they're right or wrong, it doesn't matter. It's what the government believes. Um, and so they, uh, they're not allowed to just go recruit people or talk about what they do. So instead what they do is they keep an eye on the news looking for people who survive monster attacks because those people are now aware of the existence of monsters. Plus, by surviving, they've showed that they have um, something special about them. They, they can get the, so they go and they'll meet these people and see if they'll make a good recruit. And so when there's an attack uh, in Alabama, 
only a couple hours or only an hour away from where they're headquartered. Uh, Dorcas, who's the secretary, just basically coerces Julie into getting out of the office and you know leaving leaving the kid uh, with a babysitter, mm-hmm. babysitter plural, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, going to uh, going to, to 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 see this guy to see if he make a good employee. And uh, that's where our plot kind of kicks off. Set it up. The I mean, this is the main story. So, and and we pretty much give this away in the uh, in the in the flap copy. So, um, all right. So, not too much giving away. So, what happens though is, well, they basically this is a setup, and the guy has been uh, the survivor has actually been possessed by mm-hmm. an entity, which is basically a supernatural mercenary um, that uh, is a this ancient spirit from Africa uh, that possesses people and uses them for his bidding and kills people. It's basically a supernatural assassin for hire. And um, so he, he draws Julie away. And then uh, while she's dealing with this, this possessed survivor, the, her, it's all plot to, to kidnap her kid. And so and this guy is really, really evil and clever and so he's got a, a plot in place, and he gets the he gets the baby isolated with just one person, and he attacks, and they and they kidnap the child, and so little Ray, uh, Julie's kid, uh, is is kidnapped, and so basically this evil dude has taken her child, and is going to auction him off to a group of super evil monsters, uh, and basically having a, a bidding war between all the different things that love to eat children or would really like to have the kid descended from this long line of professional monster hunters who have offended everything. And Julie has a very limited amount of time to track this guy down and get her kid back. And so uh, when I first plotted this and I, I gave Sarah like a, like a 20,000 word big old outline, um, I, I told her, I, I asked, have you seen the movie Taken? And Sarah had, and I said, well, go watch Taken, mostly just for the intensity and, and the pacing. And you see what I'm looking for here, because it's like, uh, and that, you, know, you have a desperate parent trying to get back to their kid in, in a chase. It, I also yeah, so used that, it for some of the beats, like the, the mid-book betrayal, that sort of thing. That's a great flick, too. <laughs> If anybody has it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing like a child in danger story um to uh to, to move the, the to move a mother. Um you know, there's whole genres based on, on just that plot alone. How how does it feel to um what did you bring to Julie from your own experience? Well, uh as I said, I have been there. Um so and and I have been in situations where my kids were either endangered or messed with. And, you know, it kind of, uh, it, it kind of brings the primal murder machine out, um, <laughs> which in, in Julie's case is, is literal. Yeah. Uh, and she will, she will stop at nothing. And so it's, there are there have been most people who have read this book are like yes this makes perfect sense we have had a couple of reactions saying oh no you know she'd never do that she can have other kids yeah. at which point I, I look at them and go um he, you you either don't have kids or there's Something that makes you congenitally incapable of figuring this one out. No, especially as an infant. Especially as an infant. You you have an infant. I mean, you did pass a little more by the time they're two or three. Although, even now, you know, I can go from I'm perfectly calm to I just picked up something sharp and I'm defending my kid. And they're both bigger than me. So, but... But when they're when they're really tiny for a woman, particularly, it's like you have an almost psychic link to them. I mean, I I remember how how that started sort of distancing, but 
then the other day commented that it's amazing. I know which of the kids is talking to without hearing the other end. And it's like, yeah, because, cause, you know, we're, we're still linked to these kids. I, I suspect there is no way to unhook. By the way, there is a thing, there is a sentence there, which is something about how every mother dreams of the baby not growing up. I just want to point out this is crazy mothers, not normal mothers. Normal mothers dream of the day when they can feed themselves and walk and, you know, <laughs> We, we really, it's, in fact, it's probably a sign of dysfunction if you don't want your baby to ever grow up. Well, one of the um, one of the struggles Julie has throughout the book is trying to deal with this 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 um, mother um, rage to get the child back because she's got to think and plan to be able to do it. So she's got to get a clear head at times, right? Oh yeah, she's dealing with she's she's exhausted, and she makes mistakes, and she's under a lot of pressure, and she's on her own for most of it. Um, and so I don't know. It's one of those where you're trying to set up tension, but you can't um, you can't have your character do something stupid just to move the plot along. Everything's got to make sense. Uh, so yeah. from a writing perspective, then when you got to make the bad guys smarter. So even though the character is doing, you know, is trying hard and and he's doing the right thing, it, do, it, it doesn't always work out. And uh, so there's going to, you know, you're going to try and you're going to get thwarted and bad things are going to happen. This is one of the happen. advantages, this is one of the advantages of supernatural bad guys, because if they've lived hundreds of years, you know, they probably have something up their sleeves that, you know, the mere normal human beings probably can't anticipate or including weird powers and weird allies and that sort of thing. Well, and actually speak on that note, there is is one where we're actually worked out kind of the release of this book worked out kind of timely with national news because we have like secret organizations of wealthy and powerful connected people uh-huh. doing evil things and then blackmailing the authorities to let them get away with it. <laughs> as, they're, as they're doing all sorts of sea awfulness, and you know, you know I can't, no one can really say that's far fetched. Yeah, it's all, all too plausible there. <laughs> oh, but but that could never happen in Portugal. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. The 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 action does shift over to Europe very early on. Um, so uh, how, how did you guys uh, how did you guys make that part of it real? Well, okay. Um, so when originally when I when I was plotting this, I was like, if I got a European co write co writer who has grown up there and been all over it, then by golly, I'm going to use that to my advantage and <laughs> set a lot of the books there. <laughs> that was that was from my end what I was thinking. Um, I haven't really used Portugal in much, uh, partly because I've been out of there for over thirty years. But uh, it was fun to go back. I, When I first started writing, I tried to write things set in Portugal. And it didn't work out because I was writing things set in Portugal for an American audience. Mm. And I couldn't see it from the point of view of the readers. So I gave the wrong clues. And set up things wrongly and people brought assumptions to the book that then twisted everything out of shape. But now I can sort of see both sides, kind of. Uh, I see more American, but of course I, I still have all my family there. So we still go over periodically and I still get the perspective from that side. So I could kind of maneuver both sides. I found it interesting because I thought, if anything, I was insanely complimentary to the Portuguese, if not, if not to their government. (laughs) But, but within a couple of days, I was getting emails telling me I had been kind of hard on Portugal. And I'm going, 
you know, I don't see that. I I hear what you're saying. I just don't understand it because that's not not how I see it. Um, mostly, it's the acronym for the governmental monster hunters in Portugal. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to ask you about that. Uh-oh. <laughs> and the fact they're very poorly equipped, and apparently they take offense that this imaginary department poorly equipped i i don't know what what is the acronym sarah just to let everybody well it's the name for the thing is associação de segurança sobrenatural a uh, sort of uh supernatural security association which which in in portuguese has more of a meaning of uh, department and uh, I it, what's funny about it is that I sat here you know and we said okay now we need the Portuguese monster hunters to come in I paused and went well what would it be called and worked it out and started using it and while I was writing and before I sent it to Larry I was running like every two chapters or so by my beta readers. And when they read this one, they came back and said, Sarah, have you noticed what the acronym is? (laughs) And I'm acronym stupid, so I've never noticed. And I went back and I went, A-S, oh my heavens. So... (laughs) I sent Larry and said, uh, are you okay with this? And Larry was okay. So after that, we made funny. all the jokes. <laughs> we made all the jokes and, and did U-turns in the middle of the plot to run over the joke again. Uh, my kids, by the way, were suggesting... There's a lot of ass pounding in it anyway. Yes. <laughs> and it, Well, that one of those was my kid going you know if someone sends that over over communications um you won't know if someone's just having a really great date night or if you, or someone's in deep trouble so <laughs> but but it is exactly the kind of tone deaf thing that governments do so i i again i found it perfectly plausible <laughs> You kind of, I mean, you kind of flesh out the whole European monster hunter scene, which is kind of cool. Um, we meet uh, the German monster hunters, and and they're they have a very uh, uh, different sort of hierarchy, and their their governmental organization is even more draconian, as it were, than uh, than the American one, because they got all this facial recognition technology and such um how is how is how do you picture europe as being different on the monster hunter level i've done a little bit with some of the private companies previously um specifically like grim berlin um had gotten a lot of screen time and then the uh the guys from france had gotten some screen time and so but what i did on this is i not wanting to make it too easy for Julie, we kind of took those guys out of the picture and that they were off on the siege too. And so that the people that were left behind from these private organizations were kind of like the B team. They were the second stringers. The, they were the, re- the people who were ready to retire. They were the people who had, you know, bad injuries, uh, medically retired, that kind of thing. Like at one point, a fellow that helps uh, Julie is a guy that has one hand. And uh, he's actually the guy that lost a hand to Agent Frank in Monster Hunter Nemesis. Um, but what we did is we set it up so that, uh, they, they have to work with a lot of government oversight like ours do. But, uh, one of the things that Sarah pointed out was that the, the you know, geographically it's a lot smaller and tighter. And so they have to be a lot more draconian on keeping monster secrets than you do, like say in the U S because the U S a lot of times you just have so much space. Uh, a lot of times the events are happening in place because you know, monsters aren't you know, congregating in place with a lot of witnesses anyway. And so the Americans have a little more leeway on containing things, whereas if something goes down in a European country, um, you know, it's it's usually a lot more densely packed. It's going to be a lot tighter. And then you've got, you're going to tell all your friends and relatives in the next 10 towns over. And so they, they have to be really draconian on how they keep the secrets there. And, uh, yeah. and then they watch the private people like hawks. 
is kind of how we set it up. Yeah, I'm seeing echoes well, here with the uh, Russian nuclear uh, incident recently too. So yeah, yeah. Again, all too plausible. Oh yeah, so we we have a Russian nuclear incident in the book, and <laughs> once again, we're just like only ours was monster related. So and then, wow, we were. This is just another one of those books where you write it and then a bunch of stuff actually happens. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Well, yeah, last time I did that was with Mike Coopery. That the Dead Six series, we had half of that, half of that series came true. So, yeah, watch yeah. out. <laughs> there's a, there's a lot more accommodation in Europe, sort of for monsters have in the culture, kind of they they let the this this auction take place for it. And there's this there's this uh, guy Marchand. Um, and the, the, some of the bad guys like the sanctified church of the temporary mortal condition seem to operate more freely there. Um, you mentioned you have a big paragraph in the book about how Europe is closer, things are closer together and it's old in the monster culture and human integration. There's just older and, and maybe a little more corrupt, but also a little more accommodating. Yeah, because they've, they've they've been in such close proximity for so long um, that they've kind of like worked out agreements and like a system of like you know allowable like stuff that will look you know this will look the other way for this amount of trouble you know because it's not worth rocking the boat um, and so it's, it's it's kind of a different philosophy which for Julie Shackelford is just like offensive as hell when it's when it's her kid that is the one that's in danger. And part of what I, I we got in we got in an argument on social media yesterday with with the gentleman who took issue with the chapters in Portugal. But part of what I tried to explain, and I don't know if it came through, is Portugal at this point is a highly touristic country. It always was, even when I lived there. I mean, they're 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 better organized at it now but they they always were very attractive to tourists and there's there's sort of this thing in the culture where it's like you know if foreigners are doing this thing it's none of our business mm. and in the book we have that extent to monsters it's like you know these are foreigners not our circus not our monkeys let them do their crazy stuff we don't care um, as long as it doesn't involve local people, they right. don't care. Not in my, not uh, in my backyard. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, there is there is a Portuguese expression which is for Englishmen to see, and the concept is sort of like the Potemkin villages. It's like we'll do this stuff because the foreigners expect it. And and they insist on it. We have no idea why, but we'll do this show thing and ignore it the rest of the time. What was up? To, um, I'm going to ask Tony a little bit about uh, you. Um, were an initial. You, you were the main editor, really, on on the initial revisions and such. Um, how was uh, working with Larry and Sarah, and and how did the book take shape? Um, I think you're really everyone's really proud of this. We got some good reviews and we're happy. Well, I think this, like Larry says, this is one that that's been in the works for years. We we've all wanted to see this book and and uh, was really happy when everybody's uh, writing schedules, you know, came came to the point where this book could come to be. Um, so, uh, it, it, as, as again, like Sarah, I'm a fan of the series, so I'm really happy to see this one, uh, see this one out, and to see the the character of Julie fleshed out and you know give, given her own uh, novel length adventure. Um, so that was fun. But also as a fan of the series, um, we, we talked a little bit about Julie's imaginary friend who was not so imaginary. It was great to see Mr. Trashbags <laughs> come into his own. Uh, <laughs> 
um, I, I think uh, uh, you know Julie is you know is is operating here with, with with one hand tied behind her back because her husband is off on this adventure and the A teams are all gone and so she's having to uh, she's having to um, have her quest with uh, uh, in more difficult circumstances, uh, but she does have the support of Mr. Trashbags, and that turns out to be really, uh, uh, really something. Um, and I think that's part of what I, I liked about this novel is is again how the the past and the future are tied in together. And Mr. Mr. Trashbags, you know, we thought would was put behind you. Was part of her past, but you know what? Sometimes you need those those supports from your past when you're a grown up too. <laughs> well, let's maybe we should talk about Mr. Trashbags a little since um, <laughs> he is he's also sort of the comic relief, um, if you want to call that comedy. <laughs> and eat your toes. Um, he's a shagath, but he's really little now. Um, where did he come from, and what is this stuff that Tony's alluding to? Okay, so way back in Monster Hunter Vendetta, which was book two, I introduced Mr. Trashbags, and he was a bad guy. Well, he's working for the bad guys. But what it was is, like, while they're, you know, squaring off against this evil death cult, they discovered that they've that the death cult has summoned a Shoggoth, which is this horrific, amorphous, like, two-ton blob monster, Right. And that's that's scary. And they're talking about it, and they're looking at it like like uh, old drawings of this. And Julie Shackleford's never seen a Shoggoth, as far as she knows. And she sees the pictures, and she's like, "Whoa, wait a minute! This is Mr. Trashbags." And so all the senior citizen hunters are like, "Uh oh," because <laughs> what it was is when Julie was like like a little kid, little little, this Shoggoth moved into the local forest, and it actually been sent to spy on the monster hunters. Uh, and it befriended this little um, this little human, uh, Julie Shackelford, when she was little, and she just decided it was Mr. Trashbags because he looked like a pile of trash bags, and he was her best friend. And so, so the Shawgoth, who is <laughs> I love writing Mr. Trashbags, completely 100% alien, like in his understanding of everything, just decides that she is this this lovable little mammal who is so nice. And so the, Mr. Trash Bikes learns to love. But then what happens is the monster hunters wind up seeing it and driving it off, right? And they never told Julie about this because she's a little kid, and they didn't want to say, hey, we, you know, we set your best friend on fire with a flamethrower. Um, <laughs> and so, but then what happens is during the events of Inveta, it turns out that Mr. Trash Bikes is the shotgun that's been summoned to help the, the evil death cult. And so when it encounters Julie Shackleford all grown up, it still, it still recognizes her and it still loves her. And it, it turns on its masters. And you, you think that Mr. Trashbags is destroyed. And actually um, I have a whole scene written from Mr. Trashbags point of view in that. And it's just hilarious because it's so insane. Um, you know, it's like she is cuddle bunny made of stars and, uh, so Mr. Trashbags, you think he gets destroyed, but actually what happens is there's a little scrap of Mr. Trashbags that's actually stuck in Julie's hair. Um, and so she finds it alive uh, afterwards, still like wiggling around, but it's all burnt and damaged. She doesn't really know what to do with it, and she doesn't want to like destroy Mr. Trashbags, who just came to her rescue. So she sticks it in a, <laughs> she sticks it in a tank of liquid nitrogen and freezes it. Because she's like, I don't really know what else to do with them. I can't like let a shock up run free and I mean, he'll probably just eat stuff and get big again, and that, that's scary. Can't do that. Um, so then uh, when we get into Vendetta, or we get into uh, Guardian, uh, she's desperate for help. She's on her own, and she needs something, some way to track something. Um, she needs, she, she needs uh, some way to, like, follow the bad guy. So she needs some, like, little tracking device, basically. Um, and so she, she unthaws Mr. Trashbags in a hurry, and then tries to educate him. And also, he's lost a lot of his intellect because he, you know, got burned and then frozen. And he's tiny. He's about the size of a hamster at this point. Um, and so it's like a little, little angry, hungry, high-pitched Mr. Trashbags. And she enlists of Mr. Trashbags to, uh, to help her get her kid back. And uh, Mr. Trashbags actually is rather helpful uh, in the course of the book in uh, oftentimes unexpected ways. I, I see huge marketing potential here. If we can have little stuffed Mr. Trashbags that we can sell to people. 
Well, Can actually, I... Jack looked into it. <laughs> uh, Jack looked into like how like how much it would cost to do uh, Mr. Trash Bag plushies. And it is doable, but to get like a good price, you got to do a lot of them. I don't know if we could do that. So, so we kind of backburnered it because it would be a lot of Mr. Trash Bags. I can't believe you've actually priced this out, but that's great. That's great. You could just go <laughs> scrape some mold off of you know old refrigerators and sell that. So, no, no liability, Tony. Liability. Uh, okay. <laughs> this one's really useful as a writer, both because. Uh, well, he's an hilarious character and and weirdly adorable. We feel kind of bad over him, but being so adorable. And two, it gives Julie something to talk to, and and so that she's not absolutely alone for a bunch of it, which is it's very hard to write. It seems like um, it also may be a, partly a um, some of the. Uh, some of the dialogue you imagine for Mr. Trashbags might um, be a dialogue, say, you might have imagined for your cats before, Sarah. Is that somewhat accurate, or your dogs? A cat or a dog would have to be a lot crazier to do that. But, yeah, mm. he's, what he comes across is kind of like a cartoon pet, not 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 a pet pet, but a cartoon pet. Uh particularly a somewhat insane one. Yeah. Um, I, I, mean, I, I He is still dangerous, although in a very small scale. And by the way, we had, I mean, as soon as the arcs came out, I started getting people commenting on my blog with his war cry. So... <laughs> Let's talk about the bad guy a little bit. Um, you, he's in ads. Um, why is and, and we should talk about uh, also uh, Julie's mother who shows up. Just uh, just mention a few of the bad guys, a couple of the bad guys, and and tell us about um, what Julie's up against here because it's kind of, it's very scary. Okay, well, so Brother Death is the kidnapper, and like I said, he's kind of a, a ancient monster, supernatural mercenary. Um, he's a shapeshifter, he's a mind controller, and just all around nefarious bastard. And he's really, really cocky. And there's several parts of this where it doesn't really explain why he does what he does. He does weird things um, stylistically. Um, like at one point, he's just like rocking a really big flowery hat. <laughs> I mean, he's just he's, he's a completely weird creature. Um, but just evil as hell. And then we have Susan Shackelford shows back up um, because when they're doing the auction for this kid, uh, Susan is Julie's mom, who was also a monster hunter, but who was turned into a vampire a long time ago. And we've met her uh, repeatedly in the series. She's a recurring villain, and she is just terrifyingly motherly, uh, but in a very evil and screwed up kind of way. Um, and the thing is, she's super dangerous because, well, she, you know, vampires are dangerous anyway, but she's actually fairly young for a vampire. But what she's done is she's taken her monster hunting knowledge and she has used that um, as a vampire to become just stupidly effective. And um, she is kind of a become like a boss of the underworld. She's kind of a celebrity almost in, in the, in the underworld. And, uh, so he is one of the people that is involved bidding for this, uh, the kid, uh, for little Ray. And then the other problem is you have the, the shown up again as the, uh, the church of the temporary mortal condition, which is an evil death cult who we've encountered repeatedly now. And, um, its founder was killed. Uh, Owen Pitt killed their founder a couple books back, but his daughter, has been running it in his stead. And she's actually probably more dangerous than her dad because she's actually better at running the death cult than he was. Um, and so she's kind of like public enemy number one as far as all the monster hunter agencies are controlled. So we have a lot of bad guys show up in this book. Oh, and also we introduced some new bad guys that are kind of just hanging around Europe. Um, and apparently we had like uh, the monstrous version of Jeffrey Epstein and we didn't even know it. Uh, in there, and yeah, uh, the, the Bishop of Pong is a. I was looking for a monster to use at a particular point in the middle of the book, 
And, you know, you're looking for something very tailored, and you're having trouble finding it. And then I came upon a side reference to Portuguese lore, and all of a sudden I remembered there is a Portuguese monster that is supposed to punish disobedient children. So just like being threatened with being sent away to the boarding school of Our Lady of Perpetual Purgatory, I got threatened, which doesn't exist, but I didn't know. I also got threatened with Bish Papong a lot, so I channeled that. Someone in one of our, in one of our uh, online groups was saying that Larry makes really brutal monsters, but I make insidiously sickening ones. And it's like, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's absolutely. <laughs> it's a good combination. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> as a reader and as a fan, I want to know what's uh, uh, what, what's coming up next from you guys. Uh, for me, the next, uh, I'm working on Destroyer of Worlds right now, which is the third book in the Saga of the Forgotten Warrior after. Uh, uh, Son of the Black Sword and House of Assassins. Uh, then I got a collaboration novel of John Brown that um, uh, sci-fi that he has done with the, the his portion, and now he's kicked that back. So John's just waiting for me on that. So I got those two in the pipeline, and then I got more Monster Hunter planned. The next Monster Hunter goes back to Owen's perspective, uh, and then I've got a bunch of other stuff going on too. Mostly, I got to sit down with Tony and see, you know, what order you want them in. <laughs> So that's what I've got going on. What about you, Sarah? I have half a dozen things started. Uh, one of which is kind of like the Dresden Files if Jim Butcher suddenly started taking masculine, which should be out in a month or so. Um, indie, but should be out in a month or so. It's it's a short novel, and what's the title? Deep Pink. The I know I have a funny accent. D E E P Pink. Um, oh, there is a reason for that. It it involves death metal and uh, an invasion of hell. It's. Uh, slightly the range, uh, and, and also a lot of very strange jokes about death metal cults suddenly starting to wear all pink and singing about kittens and, and anyway, that's the idea. This, of course, is, is an enormous uh, shock to everyone and and there is this poor PI who has to figure out what's going on. There's also this idea my older son wished on me that Larry says I have to write next. In oh, which no, no, the no, part is want. don't put this on me. <laughs> no, 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 no. I completely get it. I, I was describing it to him and he got this slowly got this, I don't know if it was shocked or amused look on his face, and he said, so of course you're writing it, right? And the idea is that uh, the Portuguese went to the moon sometime in the 70s because two guys got bored and were tinkering with teleporters in their garage. And there is a Portuguese moon base where they raise chickens in their vineyard. And, of course, they are at war with the moon Nazis. And this was my son. I shouldn't allow him to empty the dishwasher with me because he starts spinning this stuff. And next thing you know, I have an entire world. So that will come up at some point. Well, that sounds delightful, (laughs) the Portuguese moon base. One thing I wanted to bring back in before we, because I found uh, something I found delightful in the book was meeting the uh, the management again. Um, this is just a great character, and he is a ally of sorts for for Julie. Uh, so management's actually a dragon. Um, he is a multi-billionaire investor because you know dragons like to hoard things, and this guy has been collecting compound interest since they invented interest. Um, and so management had a secret 
cave uh, he had built for him underneath a Las Vegas casino where he was a casino boss and <laughs> billionaire investor guy. And management kind of has his fingers in every or his talons that are about the size of a car, uh, but they're involved in everything. And he's he's great. Management is very polite, very businesslike. Uh, he's a consummate professional. Um, he's got um, some issues with hoarding. Um, he he'd definitely be on hoarding, buried alive. Only his stuff he hoards is like, you know, Ferraris and Fabergé eggs and moon rocks and terracotta warriors. Um, but yeah, so he, he's uh, he doesn't he doesn't like gnomes. Oh, he he actually he management as far as being a dragon is actually pretty chill about most sentient life. He actually is not a bloodthirsty creature, except for gnomes. Management hates gnomes. He eats them like popcorn whenever given the opportunity. <laughs> and if you've run into Monster Hunter gnomes, you understand that like you can see how 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 they could really piss someone off. So yeah, management's pretty. He, he's cool with humans. My gosh, he hates gnomes. But yeah, so management actually steps in a little bit behind the scenes to hook Julie up with resources, um, and you know get her get her in and out of countries that she's now uh, a fugitive in, and hook her up with that kind of thing. Because management's got his fingers in everything. He owns satellites. <laughs> I actually love his very sophisticated persona and and what he thinks is um what he thinks is adequate accommodations for someone who's helping you know it, it's none of this we got you fake id and you have to crawl over the border no it's he does things in style he is uh, he gives some of off some of that patina of James Bond, you know. It's like, oh, we can arrange it, but we arrange it in style. So, yeah, he's great. I enjoyed him. The book is Monster Hunter Guardian. It's now at booksellers everywhere. Uh, Larry and Sarah, thanks so much for uh, being with us. Thank you for oh, having us on. Yeah, thanks for having us on, Tony. Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts. Until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them, he united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector, a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. There were four of them wearing the insignia of capital guards on their chest. As people realized the cries were coming from a man who'd just been disemboweled by an unruly giant slave and swords had been drawn, the crowd retreated. Members of the first cast might have been fans of watching bloodshed, but they didn't enjoy being participants. The warriors spread out, swords pointed at Karna, but Rada realized they were eyeing her seeking an angle past the giant. Archer on the second floor of the building with the red pillars, Carno stated, and that seemed like an odd thing to say to his assailants, until she realized that instead he'd meant the message for the cloaked figure who had suddenly appeared through the fleeing crowd. A warrior turned just in time to catch Devadas's curved southern blade through his neck. The blow was so quick, so smooth, 
that Radha hadn't even realized the warrior's head was now traveling in a different direction from his body. Devaras tossed something toward Karna, then he turned to face the other warriors. Karna caught the hammer, this one far smaller than the one he'd threatened her with, but rather than join in the fight, he went to the noodle stand and protectively placed his bulk in front of Radha, shielding her from harm. What are you doing? Help him! My orders are to keep you safe. He's got this, Karna stated as he searched for other threats. The three warriors approached Devadas. He lifted his curved blade in both hands, shoulder high, and waited, seeming as still as a statue. Devadas was in danger. If Karna wouldn't help, then she would. Radha drew her ceremonial dagger. Calm yourself and watch, Karna said. The warriors lifted their swords, screamed, and charged Devadas. The protector moved with such inhuman grace that it was like nothing Radha had ever seen. The odd southern blade took off a warrior's arm at the elbow so smoothly it was like watching a gardener prune a tree. Devadas moved around the disarmed warrior, slicing him open from belly button to spine, and then immediately swung at his companion, hitting him in the hip so hard that the warrior went spinning away, flinging blood like a fountain. That injured warrior stumbled toward the noodle cart, but that must have been too close for Karno's comfort because the big protector surged forward and embedded his hammer in the man's skull. Crack. He wrenched the hammer out and stepped back in front of Radha before the limp body had even hit the ground. Radha realized there was hair and... stuff clinging to the hammer and dripping down the handle onto his meaty hand. Karno didn't seem to notice. The last warrior took one quick look at his dying allies, then at Devadas, and decided to flee. He made it all of five feet before Devadas intercepted him, caught him by the uniform, and slung him hard against a sandstone wall. The warrior desperately swung his sword, but Devadas parried it, then kicked the warrior in the knee. He toppled, but Devadas dragged him back by the hair and smashed the man's nose with his knee. I recognize your pathetic fighting stance. The Inquisition's training is inferior, but I suppose an order doesn't need to spend much time on sword training when they mostly fight unarmed women, Devada said as he shoved him away. You! The assassin spat as he recognized the scar across Devadas's face. He tried to lift his sword, but Devadas effortlessly delivered a cut so deep that it severed the tendons and left the warrior's arm dangling useless. He let out a terrible wail that made Radha flinch. Devadas kicked the sword from his limp fingers. Who sent you? You know, he gasped. The Lord Protector nodded. Of course. Then he kicked the man in the ribs. How is the Grand Inquisitor? There was shouting. Radha looked up to see another group of warriors pushing their way through the stunned witnesses. Karno stepped forward, lifting a chain from beneath his rough-spun slave's shirt. Don't worry, archivist. These guards appear legitimate. The symbol of the protector order swung from the chain as Karno held it high. The warriors made their way into the opening created by the fight, saw the dead and dying, then they saw the swinging gold token, Protect our business, Karno warned them. The real warriors froze. Their officer swallowed hard. Do you require assistance, protector? Continue your patrol elsewhere. The guard seemed really happy to hurry away. Radha turned back to Devadas. He was standing over the survivor, sword placed against the man's throat. Blood was running from the assassin's nose and dripping onto the gleaming steel. You were supposed to be confined to your compound. No one confines me. Devadas lifted his sword, placed the tip beneath the man's ear, and sliced it off. The man screamed. Radha had to cover her mouth so she wouldn't. I will spare your life so you can send a message to the Grand Inquisitor. Oh, quit your weeping. You can always hide the stub beneath your mask. 
There was a lot of noise and incoherent sounds before the man was able to beg, Mercy, protect her, as he flopped about. Yes, yes, losing an ear truly damages one's balance. But you'd think someone so used to applying torture would be able to withstand a bit of it himself. Show some dignity. Can you hear my message now, or must I speak into your good ear? Yes, yes, the man wailed. I'll give it. Tell Armand Vulcan that we must speak. Tell him I know. The way he has poisoned the capital against my order is clever, but it will not stand. Then he bent over and struck the man in the face with his fist. Once, twice, three times. Each impact hit with a meaty thud that made Rada wince. Devadas stood straight as the assassin rolled over, coughing up blood and teeth. There was blood everywhere. She'd never seen anyone die before. Devadas looked over his shoulder and saw Rada staring at him. For just a moment he seemed ashamed, as if he'd never intended her to see this side of him. But then his face darkened, and he turned back and kicked the assassin one last time. And tell him that the librarian is off limits. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a big dose of strawberry chocolate karma to make their time on the big Ferris wheel of existence even more sweet and delicious. Plus thanks and praise to Larry Correa and Sarah A. Hoyt, authors of Monster Hunter Guardian, and to Bane publisher Tony Weiskopf. Please join us next time at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars.